Good morning. I welcome you to yet another session of the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. Continuing our discussion on the Victorian poetry, we begin identifying some common traits which mark the uh, distinctive features of uh, the Victorian poetry. Though the Victorian poets were not really uh, similar to one another, they do uh, display a lot of unique features in their uh, personality as well as in the kind of writings that they produced. We uh, notice that there are some striking similarities which make them all being identified as Victorian poets informed by the Victorian temper and also the sensibilities of the time. So, one of the significant feature is the return to the past and this also we may notice that is a counter movement against the dominant scientific and commercial spirit of the Victorian age. As we have noticed in the introductory session itself, though the Victorian age is dominated by a certain scientific temper and also peppered by a doubtful feelings which also uh, instigated a lot of dilemma between uh, reason, uh, faith, science and all that uh, were informing the human understanding of nature and also of uh, oneself. We notice that in spite of these uh, very significant movements, we also find the writers moving away significantly from these dominant uh, tenets of the times. Uh, perhaps they were also quite weary of the way in which the commercial establishments were taking over and also perhaps they were not initially aware of the ways in which the, all of these could threaten the very foundations of uh, their being. Another significant thing which could also be seen as an extension from the early romantic period is the comeback of uh, medievalism. We also notice that this serves as a potent force in literature and art of the Victorian period. Some of these tendencies may not be visible in the Victorian uh, period, this being a, a fairly long uh, period given that Vic the Queen Victoria reigned for about 6 to 3 years. Uh, but nevertheless, it is uh, possible to identify some of these common themes and common departures which makes us possible to engage with Victorian poetry as a whole. And again, uh, reiterating one of the things that we highlighted at the beginning of uh, our discussions on the Victorian period, it is only possible to give a bare sketch of the period given the prolific literary output and also the number of texts that were being uh, published and uh, disseminated during this period. Today's session, we take a look at a group of uh, poets known as the Pre-Raphaelites. In fact, they were part of a brotherhood known as the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood established in 1848. This consisted of a group of poets, painters and critics influenced by the visual arts. And again, this is another significant uh, move that we noticed from the Victorian period onwards. The distinctions that uh, separated different forms of art, it begins to blur from the Victorian period onwards. We find this tendency culminating in the modernist and the postmodernist period. The poets who were part of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, they were immensely influenced by the paintings of the contemporary. So, primarily it was an artistic movement and later it began to influence the uh, uh, literary movements and literary arts uh, in a narrow sense. And this was a movement and this was a brotherhood that popularized the notion art for art's sake, which was the English translation of a French slogan which dominated France in the early 19th century. In a nutshell, it is possible to say that the poets of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood were revolting against the ugliness of contemporary life. This ugliness was of different forms, it was physical, it was economic, it was uh, commercial, it was also moral in nature. The set of poets, they call themselves a pre-Raphaelite brotherhood for a particular reason. This term was first used when their work appeared for the first time by the middle of the 19th century. And this term stresses their admiration for the Italian art of the period before the high renaissance. So, significantly it is not the art of the period of Raphael which fascinated them, but the art form and the painting that existed before the high renaissance is symbolized by the great art artist Raphael. And uh, accordingly they began to identify themselves as the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. They celebrated a medieval simplicity and a closeness to nature in representational clarity and a deep moral seriousness of intent. And these were precisely the things that they found wanting in Victorian art and literature. Their artistic temperament was majorly influenced and inspired by John Ruskin. And Ruskin, we noticed that in his work Modern Painters, he also went on to defend them against the major attacks that they faced from the English public. The founders and the main figures of this pre-Raphaelite brotherhood include William Holman Hunt, John Everett Millay, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and William Michael Rossetti, who are brothers. And this group, they began to publish a periodical title, The Germ. And this was edited initially by William Michael, but however, it only had four issues in 1850. 
They also had a subtitle in the initial uh, editions which uh, read like this, Thoughts Toward Nature in Poetry, Literature and Art. And this was uh, quite influential and many also thought that they were going to make a quite a revolution in the uh, literary scene in England. But we also noticed that it was rather a short lived uh, influence and a short lived periodical that uh, ran from the pre Raphaelite Brotherhood. They focused on hard realism and heavy symbolism. This also made them closer to the Romantics than to the, uh, uh, to the Victorian artists. And we also find them at the same time. Uh, being forced to respond to certain dominant things of the time. They do not remain aloof from the societal and the political concerns of the Victorian period. On the contrary, they also gave a commentary on contemporary society and higher state of being. They also drew a lot of flack from the English society and uh, the, some of the major criticisms about the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood and the kind of art that they produced was that they were concerned too much with the body. So, voluptuous bodies were a part of most of their artistic works and it was uh, considered quite obscene in the 19th century and because of that many of them identified them with the fleshly school of poetry in a very derogatory sense. And significantly their influence was stronger on the visual arts than on writing and their impact was less enduring in the literary arts of the period. But however, they were referred to over and again by some of the modernist writers as we will see when we discuss the 20th century. The most important figure of the pre-Raphaelite poets was Dante Gabriel Rossetti who lived from 1828 till 82. He was a singularly unmodern figure that he ceased to uh, fascinate his contemporaries because of his peculiar style of uh, living. He had practically no interest in the life of his time and we find uh, one of the critics Hall Kane referring to him as an anachronism in these days. So that was the kind of life that he led and also the kind of belief system that he uh, held on to. He was rightfully influenced not by the London of the 19th century, but his inspiration and his influence lie in the Florence of Dante's era. So he was a man who was living in the Victorian age, but was not really present there mentally or aesthetically. His work Blessed Damsel is a perfect example of this. And the, this uh, poem, The Blessed Damsel, also had another uh, charge on it because it was the uh, one, one of the earliest poems to uh, talk about eroticism and had an erotic tone uh, built into it. But it was uh, quite new in the Victorian uh, verse. And also, if you remember uh, discussions about the Victorian prudishness, any reference or any kind of uh, mention of uh, uh, sexuality was uh, considered quite taboo in the Victorian uh, period. When Rossetti wrote about the erotic element in his poem quite publicly, it was seen, seen as quite obscene and it also uh, led to a lot of charges of obscenity against him. His intellectual convictions, however, were not of the past, but he was rather a radical. He was not a Catholic, he did not have any kind of a professed Christian faith, he was more like an agnostic and that made him closer to the Victorian age than with any other age uh, the, uh, of the previous uh, times. He was also a successful ballad writer in this element we find him again going back to the medieval elements and also getting majorly influenced by the romantic writers. His uh, uh, successful ballads include The White Ship, Sister Helen and Eden Bower. He also wrote a sonnet titled The House of Life. His general poetic and artistic uh, tendency was more towards decadence, we can say, than towards uh, the aesthetic. This is one of his uh, famous artworks uh, titled Ophelia and we find most of the pre-Raphaelite uh, writers producing art of similar kind and most of these paintings were considered quite uh, significant and successful in determining the uh, transition from the uh, uh, Victorian period towards the modernist period as well. Algernon Swinburne who lived from 1837 till 1909 is a uh, writer we have already taken a look at but however he forms a significant part of the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood as well and as Hudson points out he was the last to die of the great ra race of Victorian poets. In a certain way it is possible to say that his genius belonged to the romantic stock though he lived in the Victorian period. His significant work Ave at Well is an elegy to the 19th century French poet Charles Baudelaire. Charles Baudelaire was also a significant influence in framing the tenets of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And uh, this work, which was an elegy, it continues in the tradition of Milton's Lycidas and Shelley's Adonis. Here it is useful to remember that many uh, celebrated writers of this period, they used to write mournful or elegiac poems in memory of the uh, death of uh, their uh, favourite uh, friend or a fellow colleague. And uh, in that sense, it is also useful to remember that 
Arnold, one of the other Victorian poets, also had written an elegy upon the death of another uh, poet friend, Clough. It was titled Thursis. And Swinburne was a poet who rebelled against most of the established courts of the Victorian uh, times. And if you remember, though the Victorian uh, times were characterized by a dilemma between a lot of contesting faiths and contesting uh, principles and belief system, it was also a time which tried to impose a certain social uh, code of conduct on uh, the citizens. And in that sense, it was considered quite uh, controversial to move against any of the established conventions of those days. It said about Swinburne that in religion he was a pagan and in politics he wanted to see the overthrow of established governments. In poetry, his work confirms a collapse of conventional Victorian poetic standards. It's also said about Swinburne that though he was considered as, as a quite a successful uh, poet, his poetry had word music built into it, but uh, it, did, it failed to uh, make much success during his lifetime. And later also he was never considered as one of the greatest poets of the Victorian period. As Hudson reiterates as a part of the uh, many negative things that he had to say about Swinburne, Swinburne was capable of producing miracles of word music. But something more than word music is necessary to ensure the permanence of a poem. William Morris was another troubled Victorian writer who was purely romantic, but he could not really escape the spirit of the Victorian times. In his works, The Defense of Guinea and other poems, The Life and Death of Jason and The Earthly Paradise, we find a significant impact of these elements. And we also notice that while the other pre-Raphaelite poets were more focused on the aesthetic element, we find the aesthetic movement having a more sustained and uh, significant impact in the poetry of Morris. In that sense, his poetry is more significant to the Victorian times than any other uh, pre-Raphaelite poets. He also was immensely influenced by Ruskin and we find him increasingly moving away from the modern commercial tenets of those times and he also shows tendencies towards a socialist uh, uh, government. We find that unlike many other uh, pre-Raphaelite poets, he is not able to remain unconcerned about the uh, turn of events which were dominating the century and we also find him moving from a vague sentimental regret over the past into a positive program for the future. He is uh, in that sense one of the few Victorian poets who begin to realize that it's very important to have a hope for the future and also a practical solution to come out of this despair than to just loom regretfully over the past which has already uh, left England. In his work, we also find an indication of the powerful sway of social interest during the Victorian period. And this is not peculiar to Morris poetry. We also find it in, uh, though in varying degrees, in most of the writers who were writing in the Victorian period. It's only in his work, critics say, that we can find protest of romanticism and materialism in a practical form. And in that sense, we also find him moving away from the aesthetic and the literary uh, sort of productions and towards more useful, pragmatic and practical responsibilities in life. And he also contributes actively to the social and political life in London. Ernest Dowson, another important uh, poet of the Victorian period, had an Ernest Dowson, another significant Victorian poet, had the aesthetic sensibility of the 1790s rather than the toical self-doubt of the mid-Victorians. In our discussion, we have so far noted that there are many Victorian poets who actually lived in the Victorian times and because of the kind of crisis which the age was ridden with, we find that aesthetic sensibility is being shaped more by a preceding age than by the contemporary age. His important work was Yellow Book, in which we find most of his works being compiled and collected. He also died in 1900, the same year as Oscar Wilde. Christina Georgina Rossetti, who lived from 1830 till 1894, was the sister of uh, Gabriel Rossetti. In terms of her canonical importance, she is also placed beside Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who is considered as the most important woman uh, poet of the times. Christina Rossetti's uh, poems were more uh, significant in the sense that it had a deep religious feeling, mysticism and metrical charm. Here it is also useful to remember that the women poets and the women writers of the period were not really torn apart like the male writers. On the other hand, we find them more uh, being more grounded and also talking about uh, things with a more uh, firm temperament. As we come to the uh, fag end of our discussion on uh, Victorian poetry, we take a look at the poetry of uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, it's said about Hopkins that the Victorian despair verse reaches its climax in the poetry of Hopkins. His poetry was written in the 1870s and 1890s, but they were only published in 1918. His work was published by a close friend of Hopkins named Robert Bridges. And he is also considered 
in that sense as a poet who bridges the centuries and carries Victorian doubt to the other side of the First World War and into modernism. And because of this varying uh, decades in terms of the actual writing of his poetry and the publication of the poetry, many historians find it quite difficult to classify his work. There is a lot of uh, debate about whether he needs to be considered as a modern 20th century poet or as a late Victorian poet. We find anthologies including him in both these sets of works. Hopkins is more significant for the highly personal theories of poetry that he had put forward, namely in escape and sprung rhythms. And uh, we also find him in his uh, poetry breaking linguistic uh, rules and also being uh, quite inventive about words and uh, uh, phrases. Uh, he uh, came up with new coinages and also collocations of words. He, uh, his poetry is written with grammatical inventiveness and there is also an individual use of rhythm which was not found quite common in English poetry. His 1876 poem, The Wreck of Dorschland, is the most famous of his works. In that, we find him being inspired to a sense of grief by the death of uh, uh, five nuns in a, in a certain um, a boat accident. His poetry could be regarded along the lines of the metaphysical poetry of John Donne and George Herbert. And though his influence in the Victorian uh, period was quite limited because the work was not published, we find him being more influential on the future generations, especially on the modernist poetry. In this particular poem uh, titled The Wind Hover, we can find the use of sprung rhythms. If you read just even the first couple of lines, I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his riding. So we find this particular kind of rhythm and energy in most of Hopkins uh, poems. The other major Victorian poets who uh, wrote and uh, lived during this period include Sir Henry Taylor, Robert Stephen Hawker, Martin Farquhar Topper, Philip James Bailey, Sidney Dobell, Alexander Smith, James Thompson, Lord Macaulay, who is also a prose writer, Lord Lytton, George Eliot, Thackeray and Kingsley. Again, some of them were also significant novel and prose writers. All of these other Victorian poets who, about whom we shall not be discussing in detail. They had also produced a significant number of works, but however, since they were not considered representative of the age and their work was not considered with notable worth, we shall not be going into the details of their works. So, with this, we come to the end of today's session. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.